Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. I'm excited uh, to be uh, moderating today's Badger Dairy Insight webinar series, a series promoted by the Ag Educators on the Dairy Team at UW-Madison Division of Extension, along with the specialists at the university. Um, this Badger Dairy Insight webinar series was started to provide the latest yeah. research-based dairy information to improve animal welfare, breeding and genetic selection, automation and modernization, all for the dairy workers, managers, egg professionals and educators across the state and country. Today, I'm excited um, to be introducing uh, Dr. Paul Fricke and he's gonna kick off our Badger Dairy Insight series today and uh, Paul joined the faculty in the Department of Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on July of 1998. And he was promoted associate professor and then full professor in 2009. Dr. Fricke's research program focuses on understanding the biology of underlying the many reproductive problems presented by modern dairy cattle. The goal of Dr. Fricke's extension program is to improve reproductive efficiency of dairy cattle and to um, disseminate that information throughout Wisconsin, the United States, and the world. Dr. Fricke is a sought after speaker for dairy farmers, the dairy industry, and veterinarian audi audiences. He has spoken to over 500 audiences in Wisconsin and spoke to over six continents all across the world. Um, in a minute here, we're gonna get started with his topic, um, optimizing use of sex semen in dairy herds, but I would just like to um, let everyone know that uh, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and I'll be monitoring that and asking those questions uh, throughout his presentation. So with that, Dr. Fricke, uh, if you want to get started. All right. Thank you, Angie. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody out there in cyberspace who's who's joined. I recognize a, a few of the names, so welcome. Uh, thanks for joining uh, the webinar. I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been doing over the past few years on trying to optimize the use of, of sex semen in dairy herds. And so my outline for my part of this uh, webinar is we're going to go through a data set in which we characterize how people, how farmers in the U.S. are using sex and beef semen in their herds. Um, I'll go through a, a heifer study that we did to try to optimize use of sex semen in non-lactating heifers. And then our latest study that we've been uh, working on is in, uh, in a Jersey cow herd in, here in Wisconsin trying to optimize use of sex semen. So those are the three things that I'm, I'm going to go through. So I wanted to start and try to give you a background on why it is that we're using uh, sex and beef seam. And I think if any of you out there who are dairy farmers, uh, probably 10 years ago, if I asked whether you'd be breeding your lactating dairy cows with uh, beef semen, you would have not thought that would be a possibility. And so this is a graph uh, Dr. Wiltbank and I put together for a symposium that I did for the American Dairy Science Association. And this is data from the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding. What it looks at here is, is the phenotypic trend in days open. So if you start in 1955, obviously we want shorter days open or better from a reproductive standpoint. Uh, you can see that from 1955 till about 2000, reproductive performance was decreasing as evidenced by an increase in days open. So this was a, a trend in the dairy industry for poor uh, repro. And uh, you know, reproductive uh, performance in dairy cattle was just getting worse and worse and worse up to the year 2000. But something amazing happened around the year 2000. I like to say I was hired at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. That, that was one big thing. But actually, we saw a couple major shifts uh, in reproduction. And I'll talk about those in a minute. But we saw a, just a dramatic reversal in reproductive performance with improving reproductive form performance since, since about the year 2000. So I wanna talk about what we think uh, caused this improvement to happen. And you can, you can basically segregate a change like this into two different areas. The first would be genetic. And so this is the breeding value for daughter pregnancy rate. So this is a, a genetic uh, measure. 
And as you all know, we can now with genomics, we can select for fertility, which I think is a great thing to do. But what you can see is as reproductive performance was decreasing, uh, the genetics for reproduction was also decreasing. We were really selecting for other things, uh, milk production, type, all kinds of different things, but we weren't focused on reproduction. The geneticists since about 2000, 2005 have stopped the decline. But my argument that I'm gonna make here is that this dramatic improvement in reproductive performance we've seen since the year 2000 is not really due to a dramatic increase in genetics or fertility. So I think we have to look at another reason for why uh, repro is, uh, has increased since the year 2000. So it's really not associated with an improvement in reproductive uh, genetics. So I think there's two major things that I look at when I explain this. The first one is, is the development of time to eye programs. Of course, the OffSync protocol was developed, first published in 1995, which gave us a way to put semen into cows. We've also had a dramatic uh, adoption of these automatic, uh, automated activity monitoring systems to help us watch for heat, which has also increased of the service rate. Both these things have improved the service rate. So that's one component of this improved uh, reproduction. But the other one, and this is pretty staggering when we, when we pulled these, these data out, this is the cow conception rate. This is the phenotypic trend in cow conception rate. I believe this is only for first lactation cows, and it's a fairly small population, relatively small population that they've been tracking. So back in 2005, average conception rates were in the mid 30% range. You can see there's been an improvement in reproductive performance, even with the low conception rate. I think that's driven by the service rate uh, issues. But since about 2015, the last five to seven years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the conception rate. And I think that's due to a couple of things. The, the, the adoption of fertility programs, uh, double OVSYNC is, is one. Um, and then also this concept of the high fertility cycle, which I'm not going to talk about today, which just says, basically that uh, if you get cows pregnant in a timely manner, they don't get fat at the end of lactation, lose a lot of body condition and have poor reproduction the next lactation. So this is why we're able to, uh, it's really an interesting story as far as, uh, I call this kind of a reproductive revolution. Uh, we've basically dramatically improved reproductive performance, which caused a lot of things in the industry. We oversupplied heifers, overproduced heifers. And so all of a sudden the industry was looking for ways to right size their herds, and because fertility was so high, we could adopt uh, sex semen. So this is kind of a complementary graph. These are some data we pulled from AgSource uh, in the year 2020. And it's a stack bar graph. Um, the blue parts of the bar are beef conventional semen. The red part is Holstein, Holstein conventional semen. And the green part is um, Holstein sex. And so 2006 was the year that sex semen first entered the market. And you can see that Mostly sex semen was used in non-lactating heifers for these years, but concurrent with that dramatic increase in conception rate that I showed you, we start to see an increase in use of sex semen and as well as an increase in beef semen in the Holsteins. Many herds have eliminated uh, conventional semen now. So this is an aggregate, obviously across a lot of different farms. So that's the Holsteins. Uh, jerseys have, they adopted sex semen more aggressively because the Jersey bull calf really wasn't worth much. So they were using sex semen more aggressively, but again, with the improvement in fertility, we can see a concurrent increase in the use of sex semen as well as beef semen in the jerseys. So we wanted to kind of take a closer look at this. This is a paper that we just got accepted at the Journal of Dairy Science in which we characterized uh, the semen type prevalence and allocation uh, in Holsteins and jerseys. And so I'll run through this. This is a large data set that we got from DRMS. So because it's with DRMS, it's really looking at herds kind of in the upper Midwest uh, and the Eat Northeast. So these are, the, these are the percentages that these states contributed to this particular data set. So that, that's really what we're uh, talking about here. So really nothing from the Southwest or the South or the Southeast in this particular data set. There's 9.3 million dairy cows uh, in the United States. Uh, this data set had 8.7 million insemination records from 2019 to 2021. So we're really looking at about a third of the dairy cows in the United States with this uh, particular data set. So my grad student, my PhD student, Megan Lauber did this. So when she looked at the Holsteins, um, you, could, you could have a Holstein female in your herd and she could be inseminated to 
Holstein conventional semen or Holstein sex semen. She could be crossbred to another dairy breed, or she could be bred to a beef sire. And one of the things Megan was able to do using data from the NAAB on the, on the sire codes is pull out how these, um, which of these uh, beef sires are being used. And interestingly, you can see about a little over half, 55% of the sires are Angus, 14% limousine, 12% Simmental, 11% crossbred. Then you get into Kobe beef uh, here at 2% and then the other beef breeds here. So that's kind of how it falls out as far as the beef breeds used to, used, uh, to breed these, um, these Holsteins. Now these graphs are a little complex. Um, there's a lot of information in them. Again, there's 8.2 million insemination records from over 3 million Holstein females and over 9,000 herds in that DRMS data set. So let me just set this up for you. The X axis is service number, first, second, third plus. The columns are year, 2019, 2020, and 2021. The rows are parity. So these are non-lactating heifers on the bottom. Uh, first lactation cows, second lactation cows, and third plus lactation cows on the top. And these are stacked bar graphs again. So the red part of the bars is beef semen. The light blue is Holstein conventional semen. The medium blue is Holstein sex. The crossbreeding in Holsteins, you can't hardly see it in this graph. So that's, that's the dark blue. But if you look at the trends, um, the way I interpret this, obviously, uh, there's a lot more sex semen used in younger animals than older animals. There's a lot more sex semen used in earlier services. And overall, across the year, we're seeing an increase in both sex and beef semen used. And so the way I interpret this is that farmers are using sex semen uh, in their most fertile cows, most fertile animals at the most fertile breedings, which makes complete sense. This is just another way to look at this data and it's another factor that we looked at. Everything's the same in this graph, except across the X axis now, we have herd size from less than hundred cows in the herds to greater than a thousand cows. And this, when we looked at it, kind of surprised us. There's a linear relationship between adoption of sex and beef semen with herd size. And that linear relationship is you know, maintained throughout these years. And it's a very strong uh, linear relationship. We don't know exactly why this is the case. We can guess. Uh, larger herds have better reproductive performance than smaller herds. Larger herds can take advantage of scale when they're marketing uh, crossbred animals. Uh, there's lots of different reasons why this is the case, uh, but it, it makes for just an interesting thing to think about. Uh, what, why aren't the smaller herds adopting sex and beef semen as much as the, as the larger herds are? All right, so we have some companion data in the jerseys. And so I'll just run through this quickly. Same sort of a thing um, that Megan looked at here. The uh, sires used to crossbreed in these jerseys, uh, the proportions are a little bit different, but the, but the breeds are the same. So 39% Angus, 24% Limousine, 21% Simmental, 5%, 5% are we still on here? Is Zoom still going? 5% uh, crossbred. Paul, you're still good. We can hear you. Paul, you're muted. Okay, I just had a little problem with Zoom here. Am I back, am I back on? You are on. You're on. Okay, great. I keep getting a warning coming up. Okay, so the graphs are again the same. And the only difference here is that there's more sex semen used in these jerseys. There's less beef semen used. The crossbred Jersey beef calf is really not that desirable of an animal. And there's a little more crossbreeding happening. But again, farmers are using uh, sex semen in their most fertile animals at the earliest breedings to maximize fertility. And they're using beef semen in the, in the older animals. Same thing we saw in the jerseys here. There's this linear relationship with herd size for the reasons, again, minute, Paul, you know, um, your screen isn't showing anymore. Okay, so let me, let me redo this and let me 
try to share my screen again. I don't know what happened, it conked out. Okay, share. How's that? Good, thank you. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's again, the same linear relationship here with, um, let me get my pointer up here again. All right. Okay, so that's kind of the story with sex seam, and I think it's an interesting overview of what's happening, uh, how people are using sex semen. So I want to move on to this first study that we did in heifers. You got to love heifers. A lot of sex semen used in these animals, of course, because uh, they're they're young animals. They have good fertility. They can tolerate that uh, slight reduction in fertility we get uh, with with sex semen. First thing I want to talk about is what is the uh, what is the conception rate of Holstein heifers? And I think there's a lot of misconception. I think people think these animals should have very high conception rates. They do have higher conception rates than cows in most cases. Uh, big data set from 2006. So I like this because this is before sex semen really uh, hit the market. So I think it's you know around 60 percent. That's my benchmark. 60% conception rate with Holstein conventional semen. So I want you to remember that number, about 60%. Uh, that's what we're shooting for as far as normal fertility in Holstein heifers. We can synchronize heifers. Um, this is a, a study that was done, very nice study from the University of Florida. Draw your attention to this lowest protocol. This is a five-day cedar sink program. Most of you are familiar with, you give Gin or H, you use a cedar for five days. You give the two prostaglandins after cedar removal, and then you can do uh, timed insemination. And when they compared these different protocols, again, this particular five-day cedar sink program will give you about normal fertility in these heifers. So we can uh, synchronize uh, these animals. So uh, any of you have, who have used a five-day cedar sink program in heifers knows that the, the problem with this protocol is it's not a pure timed AI protocol. Um, you can see about a third of the heifers will come into heat early when you put them on this particular protocol. They have to be inseminated here uh, because they're not gonna have normal fertility if, if they come into heat here and you wait to breed them. So you really have to, I, I recommend tail chalking them at, uh, at either of these prostaglandin treatments and breeding these heifers to come into heat early. So we, had, we, we wanted to see if we could do something to eliminate this early estrus. And we wanted to combine uh, this with use of, of sex semen. So when you look at sex semen, there's really two big players in the market today. Sexing Technologies has been around for a long time. The bulk of the sex semen is coming through their particular process, which is this flow activated cell sorter that I'm, I'm showing you here on the left. Um, it sorts sperm based on DNA content. Uh, the x bearing chromosome has about 4% more total DNA and so uh, we can separate based on that. It's about 85 to 90 percent accurate. Most of the data is close to right around 90 percent. Uh, the problem is many sperm are damaged or wasted, so we do get a, a little bit of a decrease in fertility. Uh, the studies that I'm going to show, uh, we collaborated with ABS, and this is uh, their sex cell products. A little bit different. It's a it's more of a, a selective killing than it is a sorting process, but it pretty much does uh, the same thing to get. Uh, different populations of X and Y bearing sperm. So the thing I wanna, I wanna emphasize here, this is an older study now, uh, back from 2008, but whenever, whenever we've done randomized controlled trials, which means you flip a coin, the, the animal's either bred to conventional semen or to sex semen. Whenever we do randomized controlled trials, we see a decrease in fertility with sex semen. Um, we get about 85% of the fertility of conventional semen with sex semen. And so that's one of the reasons why we wanna to try to optimize fertility to sex semen. It's, it's more expensive. You get a little bit of a drag on fertility. So we wanna make sure that we're using it in the best way that we can to maximize that increased cost um, of that sex semen and to get females out of, out of the best animals on your farm. So I'm gonna show you the, the second experiment from a paper that this is my uh, graduate student, Megan Lauber. Uh, we did this with sex semen, and this was with the ABS sex cell product. So we worked with three, di three different farms here in, in South Central Wisconsin. Uh, I've called this the pandemic trial because we got this set up, I think, a month before the pandemic hit in 2019. And uh, this pretty much kept Megan busy 
uh, during the pandemic. The three different farms, you can see the number of heifers, the number of cows, their ME, these were good herds, um, you know, doing a really nice job uh, raising their heifers. So here's what we did as far as the trial is concerned. We said, all right, we need kind of a control group, an, indus an industry control group. And so I think a lot of heifers are managed when they get moved into the breeding pen, they get a treatment with prostaglandin to bring them into estrus so they can be caught in estrus inseminated. So that's our control group uh, that we compared to. Then we said, okay, um, let's use this five-day cedar sink program. This would be the gold standard protocol uh, recommended by the Dairy Cattle Reproduction Council. Remember, some of these heifers are gonna come into heat early here, um, and then the rest are gonna make it to the time to eye. And then we compared this six-day cedar sink program. And what we did is we delayed removal of the cedar rather than pulling it out at the first prostaglandin, we pulled it out at the second prostaglandin. And the reason we did that is we said, well, maybe we can suppress this early estrus, force the issue and get more cows to get to the timed um, artificial insemination. Now, the study I didn't show you, we had compared these two treatments with conventional semen and that worked. With conventional semen, there's no difference in fertility and we suppressed this early estrus. So we wanted to see whether this would work with sex semen. This is just to show you uh, the, diff the number of animals in these three different treatments and just show you that these are normal heifers, they're randomized treatments. And so it's a, it's a fair comparison of the different treatments that we have. So let's get to the results. With the five-day cedar sink protocol, about a third of the heifers come into heat early and they were inseminated early, okay? If you leave that cedar in for an extra day, you suppress early estrus. I think there was only one animal that came into heat uh, early in this particular group. So just as we had hypothesized, we, we did suppress estrus with that six day cedar sink group. But unlike with conventional semen, with sex semen, there was a reduction in fertility between the five day and the six day cedar with the six day cedar being lower. So we don't wanna use the six day cedar sink program with sex semen, the five day cedar sink program so we wanna go. We got about 52% conception rate, which just happens to be 85% of 60%, which we would expect to be normal fertility. We would expect that slight reduction in fertility with sex semen. Note that if you breed the heifers to estrus, it was down at the same uh, conception rate as that six day cedar sink program. So the winner goes to the five day cedar sink program. Now remember some of the heifers are coming into heat early. We split those out just to look at that. And it's these early estrus heifers that really put that fertility up. It's really interesting. Uh, that small population of heifers that come into heat early, excellent fertility with sex semen. We think it's really interesting if you think about this, if, if, if these 71 animals can have that high fertility, maybe they all can if we get them synchronized properly. But that's just how it fell out. Uh, between uh, the animals that showed estrus early versus the animals that got the time they eye. These are survival curves just to compare the treatments, uh, just showing you that with, with time to eye programs, you get the animals inseminated earlier. If you wait for estrus, the red line shows, yeah, you give them prostaglandin, you catch a lot of these heifers in heat, but a lot of heifers go a lot of days without being inseminated when you're waiting for them to come into asterisk. These are days to pregnancy, again, a survival curve. And again, you can see essentially this initial drop is the initial conception rate. So the further drop is the five-day cedar sink program. And then you can see it takes longer to get these, uh, these heifers on the estrus detection group pregnant. So we have an advantage of uh, days to conception if we're more aggressive up front, uh, getting semen into these heifers with the five-day cedar sink program. So then what Megan did is she said, okay, let's do a little bit of a partial budget analysis to look at this. The big thing I'll show here is the hormonal treatment cost. This is the classic cost that everybody looks at because it's the upfront cost. And of course, cedar sink programs are more expensive than just watching for heat and, and so on and so forth. However, Here's the hidden costs that a lot of people don't consider. We were able to get the heifers pregnant much sooner, so they had fewer days on feed in that five-day cedar sink program. And if you look at the total cost per pregnancy, 
you can see that despite the higher upfront cost with the protocol, because of the days on feed that are saved, we're actually $16.66 ahead per pregnancy, more profitable with more aggressive five-day cedar sink program up front than with kind of our standard control management. So basically you, you pay for the, that cost through the decrease in feed. So that's where your, your increase is, is coming from. And then if you look at the blue bars, we did a sensitivity analysis for feed costs change from year to year, and they change in different parts of the country. And so uh, basically we're comparing in these blue bars, estrus detection group with the five-day cedar sink program. And you can see the more feed costs, the more critical it is to get heifers pregnant sooner. And so that cost, actually the profitability actually goes up when we get into these higher feed costs. And this is just to show you that um, other people have looked at this five-day cedar sink program. Um, this is a study by Ricardo Chabel and Tiago Cunha. And just to show you um, in a randomized controlled trial, this, was, this is the conventional semen group. You can see the percent females, 43%. By the way, percent female is not 50%. It's, it's a little less than that, probably not 43%, but closer to 40. 47 or 48 uh, percent. You can see the conception rate. Let's just look at 62 days. 63 percent for conventional semen. Again, that's right in the neighborhood of, of being what I consider normal. And then here is the conception rate with sex semen. So again, randomized controlled trial. We always see a reduction in fertility in these randomized controlled trials that way. Okay, the last thing I want to cover here is the latest uh, latest study that we did. And we worked with a, a Jersey herd here in Wisconsin. And what we wanted to do is just compare um, Jersey cows that are inseminated with conventional or beef semen, either submitted to a more aggressive fertility program, double offsync for first breeding versus uh, time day, using time day I or breeding them to uh, synchronized uh, estrus. Oh, and by the way, this, this herd had about 2,000 jerseys, actually had a 1,900 99 jerseys and, and one of these Holsteins. Okay, so I'm gonna show this. This is a study that we had done previous, but we used the same experimental design. This was done with conventional semen and we compared a double offsync program, which is our fertility program, to a protocol that brings the cows into estrus. And the reason I call double offsync a fertility program is when we compare fertility of cows that are synchronized with double offsync to cows that were synchronized for an estrus, you get about a 10 percentage point advantage for the fertility program. That's why we're calling it a fertility program. 10 percentage points in conception rate is not small, it's, it's, it's a lot. So not only do we get higher fertility with the fertility program, uh, we breed 100% of the cows. In this uh, lower protocol, we were only able to catch 78% of the cows in heat. And so what you see, we, we look at the percentage of pregnant cows at 110 days in milk. We have about half of the cows pregnant in the fertility program versus only 30%. That's essentially these two numbers multiplied in when you, when you watch for estrus. So I just show this to show you that this is why a lot of people are doing a double offsync protocol for first breeding. You breed 100% of the cows and you get about half of them pregnant. So this with conventional semen, we took these two treatments uh, on this uh, Jersey farm and we wanted to compare them. So we hypothesized that with double off sync, you're gonna have a greater service rate and you're gonna have higher fertility with both beef and sex semen. And so that's uh, basically what we did. These are the two protocols I just showed you. These are basically showing when blood samples were, uh, were taken throughout the course of the protocol. I'm not going to show the data from the blood samples at this point. I'll just show you the, the conception rate data. So here's, uh, we had uh, 336 first lactation and 950 older cows, older Jersey cows that were <coughs> uh, submitted in this protocol. Um, this is important to note, the decision to inseminate cows with, with sex versus beef semen was made by the farm. Uh, we would love to do a study in which we randomize cows to sex versus beef semen. No one's going to let us do that. So what we did is within a semen type, they were randomized to the two treatments. 
And so you can see how this fell out as far as the numbers, relatively large study with about 1,286 total cows in this study. Okay, so just to run through quickly the data, this is the percentage of cows in each treatment that were inseminated. Obviously, if you put cows on a double off-sync protocol, you're gonna breed 100% of them. Uh, with the estrus detection group, we caught 75% of those animals in heat. Now, this 75% were bred to that estrus. The other 25% were enrolled into a standard off-sync program if they didn't come into estrus within a week. Okay, so we did have a way to submit those cows to uh, insemination. When um, this is just the effect of treatment, if there's no effect of treatment, there you wouldn't expect there to be uh, between the first lactation and the older cows. This is when the animals come into heat. Um, so this is relative to that first prostaglandin in those two protocols that I showed you. One of the big questions I get is, um, you know, when I put my cows on a double off sync, I've got some cows that come into heat early. I always say, you know, what percentage of cows are coming into heat early? What we found is 4%. And so it's not very many of them, although some do come into heat about 24 hours before scheduled time to AI. I recommend that you breed those animals. So the time to AI group is in blue. You can see the distribution of when cows come into estrus in our estrus program. It's about 69% of the cows are in heat on day three, four, and five with the rest on day six, seven, and eight. If they weren't in heat by this time, they were synchronized with, a, with an off-sync protocol. Okay, so to the fertility data then, um, this is the effect of treatment on pregnancies per AI. And just like in the other study, this is with beef semen. Okay, so these are Jersey cows inseminated with beef semen, either on a double off-sync protocol or bred to estrus. 60% conception rate at the first preg check, 57% conception rate at the second preg check. And that was statistically better than the 51% and 49% if those cows were bred to an asterisk. So a couple of points here. Fertility programs work with beef semen just as they do with Holstein conventional semen. Uh, the other thing I've, I've heard from people, some people complain about the fertility with beef semen, we did not find beef semen to be a problem with fertility at 60%. Uh, very good, 57% second. So really high fertility uh, with beef semen inseminating these uh, lactating uh, Jersey cows. This is the overall. So that means what we did is we added the OVSYNC. So this is the estrus cows plus those cows that had to go into OVSYNC the 25%. Again, the advantage goes to double off-sync, 60 versus 52% for estrus, 57% for double off-sync versus 47% at the second preg check. And overall pregnancy loss was relatively low uh, in this particular herd. Now, if we look at sex semen, overall conception rates are lower. And again, the, the, the decrease in conception rates, we, we can't statistically compare these in the study because they weren't randomized to, to treatments this way. But again, that 52% is what you would expect if it's 85% of about 60%. Um, so that's again, reasonable fertility with sex semen. And again, the advantage goes to double off sync compared to estrus at the first preg check, as well as at the second preg check. That's the sex semen uh, cows bred to treatment. And if you look at the overall approach here, again, where we add in those uh, cows that, that were the 25% that were bred to, a, to an off sink that weren't caught in heat, now we're seeing an even bigger difference, 52 versus 43%, 49% versus uh, 40%. So if we go back to our initial hypotheses, um, we hypothesize we get a greater service rate. That was the case in this study. Uh, we also hypothesize if you get more, uh, better fertility, uh, there's a tendency for more fertility um, at the first preg check, and it was better fertility uh, with, with the beef semen. So the take home messages then for, uh, for my section of this uh, webinar, number one, if you're using sex semen in conjunction with a time to AI protocol for first service, uh, keep the standard timing of AI relative to G2. I didn't actually show this data, um, but some people are trying to alter the timing 
of insemination relative to that last GnRH treatment. I recommend keeping it at 16 hours, which is what we've recommended for, uh, for conventional semen. Holstein cows submitted to a fertility program for a service had greater fertility when inseminated with conventional semen. Jersey cows submitted to a fertility program for first service had greater fertility when inseminated with beef semen, but not with sex semen. Actually, we've updated that they have with, with sex semen, so I apologize for that mistake there. And so I'd just like to thank all the entities that, that help fund our research. We've worked with a lot of different uh, companies to get the, these studies done. And, um, and this, uh, this was also funded by a, a grant that was funded by a USDA NIFA program. So with that, that ends my section. So Angie, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, the one take home message that I um, also got from your presentation today was just the five day um, cedar and then watching that early estrus with those heifers and the importance of maybe uh, using tail, so, uh, tail chalking there when um, those PG treatments uh, to increase uh, the 62% on that early estrus versus the 48 on that time day eye. So that's another uh, really important takeaway that I that I got out of your presentation is to yeah. when you're five-day cedar sinking those heifers to make sure that you're watching for that uh, early estrus on, on some of those. Yeah, that's exactly right, uh, Angie. And I guess the comment I would make on the heifer side of things, I, I've talked to a lot of dairy farmers uh, lately. It's interesting, there was just a, an announcement, Select Sires has announced their herds, their top repro herds in the upper Midwest here. I think there was six herds that were all above 38% pregnancy rate. And I just, for those of you that have been in the dairy industry for, for a while, to imagine that we have herds that are hitting that high of fertility is just, it's amazing. You know, 20% used to be the pie in the sky goal for preg rate that we were all striving for. Now, now we have herds hitting 40%. I was, I was at World Dairy Expo and at least three different farmers that I knew came up to me and said that they, they had hit 40%. So, so what you said, Angie, about the heifers, I think is important. I think if there's low hanging fruit, I think we've gotten really good with the cow side of things. If there's low hanging fruit, or reproductive performance on farms is with heifers. And I think we can be more aggressive with those heifers. And I think there's a lot of money uh, that, that's on the table, especially with days on feed. And days on feed is, is the biggest cost with, uh, with raising heifers. And so we can dramatically influence that by when we get them pregnant, by being, being more uh, aggressive with say a five-day cedar sink program as, as I showed. Another question with uh, producers raising less heifers because their, um, you know, their cows are on a more high fertility cycle, like you mentioned before, and they're milking older cows. Do you think th those numbers of how many heifers farmers actually have to raise will keep getting adjusted as we move through 2023 and 2024? Oh, yeah. If you look at the trends, the USDA trends on the inventories of replacement heifers, they're coming down. Uh, they they were as repro was getting worse. Heifer inventories were actually increasing, and then I can show the graph. Concurrently, uh, with that increase in preg rate and fertility, we've seen a decline. So people are that that's one of the things that I thought would happen pretty quickly with the improvements in reproduction that we've seen is that people would figure out very quickly that we don't have to have uh, 40 45 percent culling rates. We can try to get that culling rate down, and and that's pretty powerful because we. We can raise less heifers, which is a big cost. I would argue, though, if you're if you're raising fewer heifers, you have to be better at heifer reproduction um, because there's fewer of them. There's, you don't want to make mistakes with that uh, that part of the the program. And just I just want to bring up that um, there, there's a controversy right now. I would say with the, with decreasing uh, turnover rates and decreasing heifer numbers it does limit your, your culling opportunities. And so I think individual herds have to look at the quality of their animals, how many animals they're, uh, they're wanting to remove from the herd for reasons other than reproduction. And so finding the balance um, is, is what we're interested in. My, my student Megan's gonna work with uh, 
Victor Cabrera to try to do some modeling and see, you know, what is what is an optimal herd turnover rate based on the fact that we've got such good uh, fertility, we can achieve such high fertility now. You know, what is that herd turnover rate? But I can tell you're exactly right, Angie. These turnover rates has come, have come down a lot. I know a lot of herds that are targeting 30% turnover rates, maybe even, even lower turnover rates than that. Yeah, thanks to the university, uh, dairy farmers are lucky to have such research-based um, specialists like you in uh, Madison to help us be more successful. There's another question that came through the chat um, that it is an observation that appears from your research that sex semen isn't used as much in multi parous cows as it sometimes was talked about. Yeah, I think that comes out in the uh, that big DRMS data set. If if you remember those graphs, uh, there's a lot more sex semen used in in first lactation or non lactating heifers. Obviously, those, that's the most genetic genetically advanced group of of females on the farm. They're also the most fertile. So I think that's your the bang for your buck goes a long way in those heifers. But now that we've got these uh, fertility and and preg rates really high in these herds. People are using a lot more sex semen in their lactating dairy cows, and again, I'd, I'd go. I'd have any of you that are that are managing farms to think ten years ago whether you would even have considered breeding the number of lactating cows to sex and beef semen that you are today. That's a it's a result of the high fertility, and um, genomics is another big advance that we've made. The geneticists have uh, have brought us that incredible tool, and so if you're doing genomic testing, you can find a lot of older animals that are genetically superior animals, and maybe you do want to breed some of those animals, but there's just not as many of them. And so as we see that trend with increasing parity, we see decreased use of sex semen, and we see increased use of beef semen in those older animals. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fricke. Uh, 